And we are live, James. Um, guys, Brent Abel here, webtennis.com. Another episode of Seven Around Seven uh, with my good friend, uh, Jim McLennan from probably the best tennis instructional website in the history of tennis instruction over at EssentialTennisInstruction.com, which I've typed out incorrectly. I don't know how many times. That's that's a mouthful right there, Mac. What a regret on a name. <laughs> really? Really? Yeah. Only because someone else kind of came along and sort of... No, too many letters. Too many letters. Too many letters. Right, right. Well, look, um, so guys, if you've not met Jim McLennan before, I highly encourage you to um, figure out the spelling. Actually, down below in the description area is a link that will take you to EssentialTennisInstruction.com. Don't do it right now. Wait till we're done. But um, if you've not met Jim before, either in person or online, I want you to do that today when uh, when we are done. So, Mac, um, you're still toiling away at the Fremont Hills Country Club in Los Altos, California? Yes, a little less, but yes. Okay, so you have a little seniority. That's what I do. That. Yeah, good. Yeah. Good. Um, well, let's get into it. What's on your mind today? Well, I, I had suggested that I would interview you okay. and, and see whether a few questions that I could ask might take us down an interesting path. Well, with you, we, we usually go down an interesting path. So the first one is this. From when we used to play in the 70s, the game has changed. It's evolved. Maybe by the players, maybe by the rackets, maybe by the training. How have you evolved? And you could answer that as a player or as a coach or even just as a human being. What, how, how are things the same or different from when we used to hit the ball in Berkeley? Yeah, yeah. Or in, in Memphis, Tennessee. There you go which was basically fueled by a pot of coffee because you told me that uh, Bill Tilden typically drank a pot of coffee before he played. I think that was the story. Was that right? I, I know a lot of things like that, yes. This is about you and your evolution, not yeah. Bill Tilden yeah. and drinking coffee. Okay. Same so um, my evolution as a player where it used to be, you know, when I go back to my time with Tom, with Mr. Stowe, who really gave me, I think, just a few fundamentals, mostly posture, mostly balance, mostly sim simplified stroke technique. Um, but I think the one thing he gave to me that, that really kind of set me free was, look, let's get these fundamentals down first. And then I want you to take your unique personality and I want it, I want you to lay it down on top of, of whatever fundamentals I give you. And it may be that the end result looks different than the other three guys who was in, or who were in my group with him, with Tom, which was Steve Stefanke and John Hubble and Doug King. And sure enough, if you look at all four of us as individual players, we also sort of have, you know, we, we all four of us kind of express uh, the game differently, um, slightly differently, but, but the fundamentals from Tom are all there. So for me, with the way I expressed it with my personality was, well, I'm going to serve and volley a hundred percent of the time. I'm going to try to chip and charge behind every second serve, return to serve. And I'm going to look at if the guy serves a big first serve and I have to stay back. Well, Whatever he gives me next is probably, in my mind, going to be an approach out opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I was just, I sort of came up with this thing, well, where do I want to be at the end of the point, win or lose? And for me, it was, I want to be on top, or I want to be moving close to or on top of or inside the service line. And I think the message that he gave to me back then when I was, you know, like early 30s, was, well, this style of play, if you continue to force, you know, the forcing game, his all-court forcing game was 
eventually the great players become human. And they're going to miss some passing shots. And you just have to, maybe on some days, you got to wait longer than, than on other days. And uh, so that was what I did until I was, I don't know, 60, 61. And I kept trying to serve and volley and chip and charge and all this stuff. And all of a sudden I found, well, the serve doesn't have quite the same speed on it. I don't seem to be getting in quite as close as I used to. Things aren't as they used to be when I was maybe 20 years younger. And so I just said, look, I got I to gotta learn how to hit some ground strokes. And I swear for at least a year, if not two, um, I was, it, it was, it was stressful staying back. And then eventually, I don't know, I guess I just did it enough. I desensitized myself enough to staying back to realize, wait a minute, I can, I can slide this back in all day long over there cross court if I want to, to the ad court. Hmm. I can actually kind of roll a forehand if I want to all day. And you know what? I mean, I'm going to get some short balls I can come in on. And some, some of these guys I can strategically serve and volley against. And um, so for me, the, I would say the game has evolved into more of an all court player rather than just a kind of a one trick pony guy serving volley. And, and, and I think the other thing too, is I'm really working on the, on the mental part which which I've really not done a great job with, or I've just not spent enough time. I've not studied enough. You know, we've read, we've read uh, the inner game. You know, and back in the day, I thought it was just a bunch of hooey. Yeah, I, me too, yeah. And, um, and, and now I kind of go, wow, I mean, I wish I'd sort of not thought that way back then. And... So I'm trying to do more. And I think, I think now I'm trying to evolve as a player more into not being such a technical coach on the court when I play my own matches. And I don't know about you, but I mean, for, for me being, being a tennis coach for, you know, 50 years, an instructor, a teacher, I mean, what's, what's the big mistake I've made? I've focused 90% on technique on my students. Wow. And what's happened is it's worked its way into me analyzing my game technically during a match. And so it's really just sort of when I'm playing my matches, it's like this conscious manufacturing of stroke technique. And so I'm trying to, I'm trying to get myself now, and it's been probably the last year or so of really trying to get more into how can I take my, practice time, if I want to tinker with some technique, how can I do that in a very controlled, specific practice arena? Um, And then once I get into the match, trust that my, and you know this better than I do, trust the subconscious or the unconscious to, to make it work, to make the technique work. And and if I can do that, or I should say when I do that, I just feel like I play better. I just, you know, at least I have a chance of playing better. doesn't guarantee a win, but, but that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm at right now as a player is, is evolving towards those goals. Well, that's, that's eloquent. I mean, truly um, the, has that changed? your the way you interact with students either online or in person similarly yeah i think i think um i think it's a big challenge for players now with the availability of so much information at their fingertips i would call it material but we're close good um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but too well um I, you know it could be good information could be lousy information um but i think what happens is and i know one of the questions at least in your email that you sent was you know how is the internet kind of affected <clears throat> online and coaching and to me it's my biggest frustration mac is 
<clears throat> knowing that I'm probably only inspiring a handful of players to actually do the work. That if they really have a goal of, you know what, I'm a 4-0 guy and I'm semi-retired or fully retired and I really want to spend some, you know, I really want to do it. I really want to start playing some tournaments. I think I can play at a little bit higher skill level. <clears throat> and trying to inspire them away from stop looking every day on YouTube for some kind of quick fix nugget and find yourself someone that you really believe in, someone that you really trust, uh, a, a coach, and, and, and just assume that you don't know when that result is going to ever show. I mean, it, it may never show up. But I know when I got together with Tom, I finally felt like, you know, this, I'm, I'm in the right spot. I'm in the right place. I'm with the right person. <clears throat> and even though we'd go Wednesday mornings from nine to noon up at, up at uh, the, what the Justin Siena junior high school, I think in Napa. Um, can't yeah. remember. That's even the name of the school, but I'd come back. And for the next few days, I'd be so excited, but I, I was all over the map. I mean, I was literally all over the Brooklyn tennis club in terms of spraying balls and this and that. But I just sort of felt like I've got the right guy. I don't need to go around the club and ask other players questions or this or that. I don't need to, you know, I, you know look, we didn't have YouTube back then. That was back in the back in the early 80s. So maybe for me, it was easier to be able to embrace um, the long term and, and just just, you know, not having the instant gratification availability. And so for, for me, in terms of coaching, that's my biggest frustration is I feel like I'm just only really inspiring a handful of people out of the, you know, 18,000 on my subscriber list. And I understand that a lot of people don't have the same goals that I do, which were when I went to Tom, I didn't really have any goals about, well, I want to be a national champion. I want to win a gold ball, blah, blah, blah. All I knew is I thought I was underperforming. I was underachieving as a player. You know, that's a good jumping off point about you use the word whether players will do the work. And now you're talking about underperforming. And one of the things that I noticed that I'd like you to speak to is it seems more and more rare that I see people willing to pursue the work. You talked about sliding another backhand cross court. And there's a friend of ours that I've tried to pursue that dialogue. And he knows me and trusts me and so forth, but it's just, it's not something that he wants to do. And somehow that's one of the most important shots is to say, let's, let's exchange backhands and see if you're any good at this to the opponent. Um, do you, are you able to get people to do the work when you're working with them in person? Well, you know, I'm, not, I'm not doing any encore teaching. You know, I'm not doing, I'm not teaching any privates. Uh, probably stop that. Well, when I, you know, when we went full time down to the, not, not full time down in the desert, but when we started spending half the year down in the Admission Hills Country mm -hmm. Club. And then, you know, and now we're in Colorado the other time, but before that, until last year, we were in Northern California. So I'm not doing any on court stuff. It's all, it's all online. Now, look, I am doing some, someone will send me a video and we'll do a private one-on-one -on -one thing like this and I can bring up their video and we can look at whatever technique they're working on. Or maybe they'll, they'll even shoot some video from, uh, from the back fence and I'll get four games, right? Where they stay in the same side where the yeah. camera is and they'll serve twice and they'll return twice. And, you know, you can know as well as I do, if you can watch them play four games, you start to understand what their instincts and tendencies are. Yeah. And, but I think that trying to inspire someone to, even if you don't want to go out there and win a national title, just that you think that you feel like I've got a better level of tennis in me, just don't know how to get there. And, and I think there's 98% of the players out there want to do it like this. And, you know, there's all kinds of hypey, 
headlines and subject lines and emails out there that promise the quick one, right? And so for me trying to inspire the other 2% to go, you know, I just don't believe that that, that you can take it to a new level um, quickly. I just think you're going to have to get in for the long haul, embrace it. I can't guarantee it's going to happen for you. But if nothing else, if you'll commit a year or two or five or whatever it takes, then something good's going to come out of it. And but but so much of this is about the perspective of the coach and, as you say, the personality of the student. Um, once I played John Spiegel when I was about 14, maybe 15, and he made the comment to me, he says, boy, you'd be so much better if you could go to Tom Stowe. But I didn't even know what he meant mm. at all. And even when I was at Chico, uh, Betty Best was being coached by Tom, and I still didn't know what this was about. But I think that there have to be very qualified coaches that teach versions of this, I think. To teach but, versions of what? What, what, what? what Tom is teaching or versions of you got to be in it for the long Versions long. of what Tom is teaching. I, maybe Tom – described it differently or, you know, because I, I went down the same path of being way too technical and now I'm moving, but um, it's interesting. The comment you make that's really most apparent when I watch others is whether or not they're on balance, just that, just that. And, and it intrigues me how difficult it is to start that dialogue with somebody because they're looking at me like, oh man, you know, he's going to say something, I'm going to be worse. And so I don't always go on that dialogue, but I, I see balance and I see rhythm and I see ease in a good player. And I'm sure we could see that in you. So when you evolved on the baseline, were you tinkering with grips or were you tinkering with attitude? Because, you know, serve and volley is all about a continental grip, I think. Yeah, right. For everything. <laughs> um, you know, I didn't think so much about grips. I was just thinking more about patience in terms of, wow. can I can I get this voice off my shoulder that's saying, so what if this incoming shot is only, is going to land six inches from your baseline, you should go in. And so, and so I just got out there and decided that, first of all, this was a change I needed to make. And so for me, it was less technical. It was more mental. It was developing the patience that, that um, it's okay to stay in the point. I don't have to force things so much every time that either I'm really trying to execute, you know, a dead perfect first volley that probably won't come back or play an average volley over there and just challenge a guy to thread the needle. And once in a while they'd thread the needle, but most of the time they wouldn't. Um, but I had to get into that mindset, Jim, of just like you said, it's okay to slide another backhand over there cross court. And if that means, I mean, my, my average point or shot duration now shots per point is twice as much as what it was 10 years ago. And it, it probably means that it probably means that that the skill level below me 10 years ago uh, where I was playing serve and volley, uh, it was pretty, it was pretty apparent now because I'm now because the points are lasting longer, that skill level's gotten closer to me. Wow. Just because I think, I mean, I just, and, and, and that's that's a challenge in itself, right? I'm probably winning a smaller percentage of points than I did before, or lesser percentage. But, I mean, we, you know, we, you know, the stats on Novak and these guys is, I think over the course of the year, they're, they're winning 52% of the points they play. But, you know, and, to me, you something you mentioned a dead perfect volley and if we watch on on tv we see less and less volleying and i wonder whether that influences our normal recreational players because 
it feels to my eye that less and less of the players at any level at our club that play have a sense of moving forward. Could that just be the mechanics of a volley or is that attitude? Uh, well, I think it's, it's what we see in the tennis channel, right? So it starts there and it, then it works its way down to the club pro and depending on, I mean, how many club pros are at our age? I mean, <laughs> not that many, right? I mean, aren't they a whole lot? I, I mean that, I mean that, I mean that statistically, seriously. No, I know. So if most of the club pros are what, 40 years old on average? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they're, they're at that age where they've probably been raised on a steady diet of, of, a semi to a full Western forehand mm -hmm. grip, um, a two handed backhand. And I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying that's the reality of it. Yeah. And, and that playing doubles was, well, gosh, I remember even when I was running the, the zonal 16s, um, I can't remember. Was, was that the name of the tournament when I was at Tiburon, but that was back, you know, in the early nineties, Right. And doubles was just like thought of as just like, you know, big whoop. So I just think that that's what's being taught and that's what's being shown. And and anyone who's got a website or a YouTube channel that's based solely on serve and volley. <laughs> probably tough to find. So. It's just a sign of the times. It's just a sign of the times. And, and I also think, too, like I remember. I had some, I had some, some of the top kids, one kid who I think, you know, Scotty Scott from, yeah. from Belvedere and, you know, they came over to get coached by, by me in the early nineties because they knew, well, Brent's a certain volley guy. Mm -hmm. So, and we're thinking that maybe Scotty could use a little, a little cleanup here on the volley <laughs> and, and, uh, and really all that they needed was just, a whole bunch of experiences in drills, in in practice points, in practice sets, and and sort of that 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 constant um, reality thing that look you're going to get passed a few times, yeah. and the one time you get passed, if you think I can't do this, well, that's a kiss of death. So I think that's a big deal with with the volley that we don't see is that I think too many players go out there. They don't really understand the approach. They don't understand the mindset of moving forward, approaching, and putting your fanny up there and just telling the guy, I'm going to give you three feet here to my right, three feet to the left. If you can top a lob over me, great. And I know you'll be able to do it today in this match probably four or five times. But I've always felt my job in that situation when I was playing serving Bali all right, man, Jim. I think you got five, maybe six, really great passing shots in your bag in your bag today, and mm -hmm. I want to see how soon can I pull them out of that bag in our match. I might go down a break in the first set, but you know, I think the message I got from Tom was: any player, no matter no matter how good they are, have really got a finite number of those passing shots in their bag on any given day. So just go out there and just pull them out. Yeah. So a little you, bit off topic. You mentioned about semi-Western and full Western. There's a lot of young kids that are coming to the club now that their first experience is to learn a big forehand. And most of them hit it so hard they can't play with another. And so then I'm walking around at my advanced age trying to create some volley drills. And it's fascinating if your first two months, six months or more is about a big forehand, how difficult it is to volley. I'm intrigued by that. And so when I met Tom, <laughs> older than you, uh, my first lesson was on a stool. You remember those. Sure. And he would toss the ball, and I had to hit it exactly back to his hand so he could catch it, this older man. <laughs> I don't even remember how old he was then. He wasn't in good health, though. We knew him in his 70s, I think. Well, when I saw him, it was 80, 
81, 82, 1981, 1982. Yeah. So, but no, he was in, he was in lousy health. And I, I would never have ever sat in the stool and tried to volley to his hand because I'd be scared to death. I'd hit him right between the eyes. Well, he wanted me to hit it so soft he could catch it. Yeah, and so well, I've, I've adopted that method, but it just, it, it intrigues me about how rare volleying is with these grips. And so, you know, you're, you're speaking to something that doesn't always exist in the world we live in about fluency at the net. So here's another question. I'm trying to reread a book called The Fundamentals of Tennis. And it started about, it's very well written, 1970, my era. And they start off by saying tennis is a defensive game. And even when you're serving and volleying, it, it is a defensive game in that you're not trying to blast the ball. You're just using the court. I wonder whether the game is better taught to adults or children if the defense is taught first instead of later. you have any thought on that? Well, my first thought is when you say that is that when is, is players are going to think, well, defense is about staying behind the baseline. And you're absolutely right. When you just said that certain volley – is really a defensive shot making. Uh, yeah, because yeah, I, 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 I don't know how you, I don't know how you'd approach it in terms of overcoming what we see on TV. Well, and I, on TV, the, the players are much stronger, hit the ball much harder. I couldn't even imagine trying to volley the ball against a rev. But but we're not. I'm not working with people that play at that level at all. I think I got this no, idea from Michael Jessup, who said, wonderful player and coach here in the Bay Area. That when he was younger, if I quote it right, he was a defensive player and he thought he learned more about the game that way than by blasting it. Or maybe he couldn't blast it at that point. Well, I would think that most of our online students. Um, conjure up an image of, of defense of uh, being more of a kind of a moonballer, being more of a pusher, yeah, being more of kind of staying back, being more of of just kind of waiting out that opponent over there. Yeah. We kind of miss. So um, but I think what you could think about is that is different heights above the top of the net could be could be thought of as defense, safety, offensive. Not that we can't hit a, a decently semi-looper, semi-topper offensive approach shot. I mean, to me now, and in, in, in I probably learned this over the last 10 years, is that there's certain incoming balls when I'm on the baseline that if I can get around them onto my forehand, not way over, not way over the ad side, but just a hair, just to get and yeah. then have that, that that lane back over to the ad court where it's not up the line, it's slightly cross court. Man, I mean that semi topper looper, not a lob, mm -hmm. not a not a drive. Most guys, you wouldn't, but most guys step back when they see that, and that's my invitation to approach. Yeah. Right? Well, even, you, even would, you, would, you would take that and you would go, thank you very much. And you'd step in and and give it the old conk, give it the old ride. And I go, huh, well, that's not going to work. Yeah. Well, this is it's it's interesting whether even there could be coursework <laughs> yours that try <laughs> to explain how the court, if if the game could be defensive, the advantage is where you how you use the court itself. And that's what you're really speaking to. And the, the all court forcing game, which is a bit rare now, although I loved it when Federer would chip and charge on his backhand in the deuce court, perfect play. Forehand, he's gonna crack it, but he would come in, oh, not often, but it was always a deep approach. It was manageable and once years ago, I felt I had a good chip and charge on my forehand of all things in the deuce court. But what you're really talking about is that if somebody wants to have 
rhythm and a rally and you come in on their second serve, the whole game is turned upside down. And I'm sure a lot of people have said after they played you, I've never played worse. Do they say that? I, Not to I, rub it in, but I mean. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I. Uh, I'm you're a hard person to play against. Um, I'm thinking of one guy that you and I know now. I can't remember his last name. Um, anyway, yeah, I mean, right when I started to work with Tom and uh, Larry Carroll. Okay. And you know, and you know Larry. And, yeah. You know, fine, a nice player. And um, when I, you know, before I went to Tom, he was, uh, you know, he was a much better player than I was. And then after a couple of years with Tom, I just did the helter skelter. I'm coming in behind everything. And I just went through him in this one day court six, Berkeley tennis club, Pacific coast seniors. I mean, I can still remember it vividly <laughs> and him just coming off the court. I mean, coming up to shake hands and just go, I don't ever want to play you again. <laughs> and you're yeah. right. I mean, that was, but I think, I think, you know, I, I've now that you mentioned the all court forcing game, I think that's one version of it which is as the player you are you are visiting all parts all all parts of the court to force that player into rushing strokes into feeling like they've got to go for passing shots whatever but i think another another part of my game that i feel like i've well i know that i've developed and i take it i take the reverse of the all court forcing game in terms of i'm putting it on you to visit all parts of the court. Excellent. Like yes. Players want to stay back or do whatever. No, no, I'm going to drop you. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make you visit those parts of the court um, that you apparently don't want to go into. So I'm going to make you an all court player. And I just, I, there's a guy at the Berkeley tennis club name, not to be mentioned. Um, good athlete, great guy, plays a lot of tournaments. And, um, he and I, or, or he's in the same age group that we are. And I saw him maybe a year ago over at Berkeley at the tennis club. And he, we'd, we'd both just come back from playing the Houston indoors. Maybe this was two years ago before COVID. And um, he'd lost in the first round and, and, um, and I'd had a good tournament and he just started peppering me with questions. And I said, man, look, the one shot you got to have in this age group, you got to learn how to play the dropper. And he goes, oh, and that's not tennis. And I just said, I can't help you. <laughs> I can't help you. So when you mentioned all court player, that's, that's, that's what came up for me. Well, the, the tournament kids that, that practice at our club, the shot that they miss the most is the approach shot. They, they, they seem to be unable to take some pace off the ball or control the speed or the placement. And certainly what you're talking about is shorting the ball for the opponents, just saying, okay, what have you got? What have yeah, you got? And it's, it's a lot about disguise too. So if you can play the cross court backhand slider all day long and from the same setup, you can also mm -hmm. pull the trigger on the drop shot. I think you're not going to obviously win every one of those, but for me, what happens if I show enough drop shots, they start to play closer inside yeah. on top of or inside their baseline. And then the standard slice at them um, is way more effective. So <laughs> do you have a forehand drop shot also? Oh, totally. Oh yeah. Of course. Got do you to. change your grip? Um, no, I mean, look, I'm still, I'm still primarily a hybrid continental Eastern back, Eastern forehand, forehand grip. <laughs> However, there are times when I can get over full Eastern forehand grip. Maybe it's a hair towards semi. I don't know. Mm. But that's more sort of on the ball that I was describing when I really want to kind of loop it over there. Okay. Um, but no question, I think that you've got to be able to have a forehand slice. you got to be able to have a forehand dropper oh. from the same set of position. And if you don't, you just become too predictable. And, well, and, and unless you believe or choose to be predictable, but at our club, I would say the shot I see the least is drop shots. And even we have a very good player, very good player working on the drop shot, but essentially it's sort of softly hit as a drop shot 
rather than with wicked spin? I don't think I've got a lot of wicked spin. I really don't. I mean, I oh, just think, don't. I, I, no, I'm not looking. I'm not looking to hit oh. a winner. I mean, my actually my strategy, my tactic is I want to <laughs> hit it well enough that that when they get there, they don't really have any offensive. Opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I don't want to hit because if I hit it too well, then there's no effort on their part to 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 try to go. So I haven't really drained any fuel out of the tank over there. Oh, so you, want looking, to, you want to punish them? I'm, I want I to punish it. them. I want them to at least make an attempt. And you know, if they're not embracing fitness as a <laughs> as a part of their foundation as a player, then I'm gonna I'm gonna exploit that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Hopefully you're acquiring a few friends along the way. <laughs> Not really. I think I'm going in the, in the opposite direction. <laughs> well, <laughs> as long as you live online, it doesn't matter, I guess. That's right. Let me see. Do I have anything else I was going to ask you? Hold on. Well, I got a couple I want to ask you. Oh, boy. Okay. How has the. We talked about the. Oh, before you go there, talk to me about problem solving and whether or not in a match you're problem solving by the score or whether or not you could convey anything to students about problem solving. Because certainly if you're a baseline hitter, the only problem you have is if the other person is more consistent than you, which is a simple way to play. Let me tell you. Just or, 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 if, or if the opponent decides I'm going to bring you up and make you an all-court player. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, problem solving, I didn't have any, you know, back in the day when I was just playing serve and volley, there was, there was no problem to solve. It was either I won or I didn't know what to do next because, okay. and there were a couple of guys I played who, who wanted me up there, who wanted to target. And, um, you know, and if I was serving really well on that day and I was hitting that first volley or the transitional shot really well, okay, I'd probably win. But, but eventually it, 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 it got to be where there were some defensive guys out there, counter punchers, who really loved having me come in, knowing that I couldn't serve great to knock them off. I couldn't hit, play that transitional shot tough enough. And, and yet I didn't, have, I didn't have any problem solving, not skills, but I mean, what would, what would be the solution there? Well, the solution would be simply, well, I got to stay back a little bit and maybe work my way in on on a better on a better offensive mm -hmm. opportunity. So uh, the first team I got uh, selected to a USA team, 2009. We went to Perth, Australia. We played on the artificial grass there, right? And I played both the team event. My first time on the team, I was super excited. Um, and then the following week, you play the individuals. And so in the individuals, I'm going along. Um, and I get to the quarters and that night, the night before it rained and, and the artificial grass is actually this plastic <clears throat> stuff with sand thrown on it. And I got an eight o'clock match and we go out there and it's still just super slick. And the tournament director says, we're going, let's go. And I went, all right. So I go out there and first point, serve and volley, hit a good serve, come in, split step. The legs go out from under me. I mean, like, you know, the sheriff of a cow on ice. And I'm down there not worrying that I've lost a point. I'm just thinking, you know, what body part have I destroyed here? And I'm okay, get up, second point, exactly the same thing happens. And after the second point, I realized I'm kind of screwed here. I can't <laughs> do what I do. And I didn't really have, I didn't really have a, a, a ground stroke game or I didn't have the patience to stay back at that point. Um hmm. So that was kind of, for me, the epiphany that, that was, uh, if you want to compete at the highest level in your age group, you probably need to be able to also do this other part of the game. So problem solving for me now is, it, it, it could be that on this particular day, I just feel the sort of volley. It just feels great. It feels great. Mm -hmm. Go in there. And the next thing you know is I'm gotten broken. I'm going, well, maybe against this guy, it's not working no matter how I feel, no matter how much I want to jam that, that, that square peg into a round hole. 
I just can't do it. And I used to be super stubborn, Jim, super stubborn and keep trying to force. I go, well, I just got to do my A game even better today. And I could never figure out how to do that. Are you able to convey problem solving skills to some of your online audience? Yeah. I mean, the only way that I, that I tell them is say, so, you know, you've got to be able to, if you need to stay back, you got to be able to stay back. If you, if you need to force it more against this guy, because the guy is never going to miss over there. Well, then maybe the problem, I mean, maybe the solution is you got to play some more drop shots. You've got to figure out where do they not want to be on the court. And I think it goes to the thing of thinking, well, why would I feed them what they want as opposed to yeah. what is what does this guy not want? And because I think we I think we're so self not I don't mean conceited, but we're so centered about our game and what we want to do. And we've worked on our technique all yeah. week and we go out and play a league match or a tournament match and it's not working. So how do you on that day go, okay, well, I'm not, I'm going to throw my pride out the window or I'm not going to be super stubborn and I'm going to go ahead and figure out what does this guy not want me to do? And sounds simple, but it's, it's rare. For me, it's very rare. For me, it was really hard to come into that. All right. Swallow your pride today. Your certain volley thing is just not working. Maybe I'm not, not executing it or for that opponent over there, that's exactly what they want. And for you to think to yourself, and I used to, well, I just got a certain volley better today. Oh. Well, there's, well, there's my, there's, my hunch about problem solving is, is we do a particular doubles drill where I toss the ball and get somebody way out of position just to see if the other side can notice where they might hit it or might not hit it. And so, so, all right. So go through that again. So you're talking about a doubles drill, but, but it's the same for singles. In other words, once in an interview, um, Jim Courier was asked something about his experience as a player. And he said, immediately, he said, the biggest thing was when Jose Higueras told me to pay attention to the other side of the net. And, you know, he's coming from Boletari and it's just about, knocking the ball. And I think the other side of the net is really this unexplored area where we're very much about how to hit the ball and rarely seeing exactly what's going on. And so I even wonder whether with some of the players, if they're not problem solving, it could be that they can see the other side of the court, but they don't have a drop shot and they don't have a lob. They just have that big old shot. Well, that's okay. Modern living. I Nothing will change, but the fun, I think, that we both have is to try to distill and share these things that we sort of know for someone else to say, well, let me try that, you know. Well, okay, let me try that. And, and to me, that just, I mean, I, I'll, I'll get, and I'll get into an email exchange with someone and they're, they're saying, well, <clears throat> what about this? And I'll say, you know what? Yeah, you really got to develop the drop shot. You really got to get them off the baseline. You know, rather than trying to go from corner to corner and stretch them out, yeah. where it, you know, I know you're 65 years old or whatever age group you're in, it's all relative in terms yeah. of trying to beat that guy from corner to corner is way tougher than just play the dropper and bring them in. And then they say, all right, well, I'll give it a try. I, yeah. Yeah, I'm playing Friday. I'm, I'm playing my buddy Friday. Oh, I'll try it. I'm just thinking. You know, why don't you spend two days before Friday's match with your buddy and actually work <laughs> on it and do it and get a feel for it and then work on it for the next year? Well, but you used the term focus practice earlier, and I think that's something that's rare. I mean, we like to play. We like to hit the ball. But can we pick a shot and tinker with it long enough that you say, oh, this thing works? We had a little boy that moved to Spain that developed a drop shot return of serve. <laughs> really kind of fun. And in a way, he would sort of, and he was young, so he's not playing big tennis, but he would sort of walk closer to the service line and then cut one and walk back. And 
it was just, it was amusing. And so now we have another little guy who's trying to learn the drop shot return to serve. And so he serves to me. In fact, I told him yesterday, I refuse to lose to an eight year old, <laughs> although he's nine today. Oh, well, that's well, different. Yeah, <laughs> well, I probably this year he'll beat me. But you know, so I'm just hitting drop shots. And so he, he says, let's keep doing this. So then he starts coming in right after he serves. And so then I chip one up the line and then he looks at me like, oh, okay, I can learn that too. But you know, the, the fun is just all this wide range of experience you can have with hitting the ball. I mean, that's, I think that's the game that we try to, it, it might even be fun. The Tom Stowe thing we tried maybe was okay. It was fun for everybody to meet you guys and everybody talked. I didn't apportion the time equally with everybody, my mistake, but we've we've often talked at our club about could that be done again something like that but whereas instead of you talking you'd actually have a court and people would go from court to court and sample you and sample because even we have a very good player at our club that's working with john hubble now and i so want the parents mm -hmm. to say well you know mclennan knows that stuff too but john has a reputation so i get it but yeah. it's it's just about balance and simplicity. And they tell me that he's constantly simplifying her game. And that's all Tom did. Because even your best comment ever in your post is that you asked Tom, when do we do the advanced stuff? And he said, there's no, there's no advanced here. Right? Well, yeah. I mean, that was, that was a scary moment for me. Yeah. I mean, I just realized as soon as I, you know, I wanted to bring the words right back, but he just... <clears throat> He basically said, once you master this stuff. Yeah. That's it. Advanced part of the game. Yeah. And so, so Mac, um, look, we, we are 47 minutes into it. Yeah. Um, and, and there's, there's a seven, easily, there's a seven there. I could easily go for 47 more. Let me ask you a question. And it's something that you asked me earlier and I just want to get your, <laughs> your version of it. Um, how do you, or do you care anymore about, cause you and I've talked about this stuff ever since we both got online and what, I think you were a year ahead of me in 1998, right? I mean, I got my first domain in 1999. When did you guys start with, with tennis one? Tennis one, boy, oh boy. Tennis one is now closed down. Yeah. Um, I think it started maybe 29 years ago. Wow. Okay. Well, that's, that's basically Kevin Pope. And yeah, this guy was a website builder that loved tennis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's been, um, so it's been 29 years for you, for, for you. It's been 22 for me. Um, what's, what's been like the one thing over those 29 years of not teaching on the court, but teaching online that, that you've kind of come away with in terms of, I've got to do more of this to help my online players. Who man, oh man. <sighs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think what I took most from the first few years from tennis one and, and there were others tennis server was there, but we were sort of, we had a lot of traffic, a lot of traffic. I liked most when I got personal notes from somebody saying this resonated or that resonated, but to try to help more. One of the guys, something that you have done over the course of 29 years that really clicked with enough online players that there was probably an epiphany you had where you said, I got to do a lot more of this. Well, it'd be better at this point if like the phone would ring and I'd have to shorten the interview. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I, somebody asked me once, they, they liked my material on court and they said, does this scale? And that really drove me to even build our own website. Uh, with the long name. And I don't know. I mean, well, I know for me, I, I know for me, the one thing 
um, that seems to doesn't solve problems, but it seems to resonate with players uh, is spacing. And and you you actually you actually kind of I like that spacing. I think you gave me that term, or maybe. I didn't know what spacing meant, but you just said, well, it means spatial relationships of the path of the incoming ball. And I went, all right, that's what it means. Um, but I think that that's the first thing I look for when I'm, when I'm looking at a player either on the court or I'm looking at a player in the video, I'm looking at the consistency of their spacing. And if the spacing, you know, I mean, under a controlled underhand ball fed uh, a feed, they got the greatest forehand in the history of the game. But as soon as you start moving them around and you start speeding up the the feed, now all of a sudden they're either crowding the ball or they're too far away or something's happening. But the spatial distance away from the path of the ball is not consistent. And so I'm saying if you can get that consistent, then we have a chance of doing the Tom Stowe, let's see what we can cut out of, cut out, what, what technical part are you doing that when your spacing's right consistently that you still have this flaw in the technique that is that's holding you back from being consistent? And so for me, that's the one thing I think I've learned in my 21 years, 22 years, has been make sure someone's got the spacing thing in their mind that that's really a fundamental that if they don't have that, then the game becomes technique wise, just kind of improv. (laughs) Well, you're, I'll be doing some writing today about drop shot and spacing. I'll, I'll reference you in both articles. I will. (laughs) I appreciate that. All right. Well, listen, I would tell you to conclude when I, don't see a version of what you're talking about, about positioning with the ball. I think it goes back to how quickly people can move their feet and how accurately they can move their feet. And I think most think footwork is how fast you are. And I think, no, footwork is just the dance, how precise you are. If you can't get to the ball, call it, give them the point. But if you can get to the ball, can you be on balance? Because that's, the spacing is also about balance. All right. Well, no, I mean, there's no question. I, I just, I remember the first, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes for every time with Tom in that group every Wednesday morning. Yeah. We wouldn't hit a ball. Yeah. We'd just move around the court and he'd be looking at balance and posture. And if he didn't like it, he'd, he'd let you know. He, he said to me the same. He said, if you can't re- rehearse gracefully without a ball, forget doing it when the ball comes over the net. Yeah. So I'll work on that one too, rehearsal. I'm happy to do this again. I think that most of the of your viewers have probably already um, had lunch or whatever. <laughs> you do very good work. You're an extremely dedicated player. And I think more and more people can see who you are. It's kind of fun to get in there. So thank well, one you. One of the things, one, you know, I'll tell you, one of the things, and I wish that I wish you were still playing tournaments. I, I mean, I wish you were still going out there and mm-hmm. playing some tournaments, doing a little traveling. One of the real satisfying things that I that I get to experience is I get to go play tournaments, and whether it's Charlotte, mm-hmm. whether it's Atlanta, whether it's uh, Baton Rouge, whether it's Asheville, North Carolina someone's going to come up and say, Hey, I'm so-and-so I'm one, I'm one of your web tennis guys. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now, I really, I, you know, I love your work, but I really enjoyed watching you play today because it just makes it so much more, so much more real. So that's a very satisfying thing for me. I appreciate your kind words, Jim. Um, essential tennis instruction is where they can find you. The link is down below in the description area. Um, where else? I mean, I don't see you on Facebook very much, right? Uh, no, I, I'm not very comfortable with all the social media. Yeah, I don't blame you. Well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you, I mean, what do you, I, I know that you've got the membership that you're that you're doing a monthly, 
kind of a monthly large thing. Is there anything else you're doing besides besides the monthly uh, uh, instruction to your members? More and more, the focus is on the 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 monthly site. Um, and there's about 10 years of, of material in there. And a lot of it's repetitive, but it's it's all sort of about the same thing. And I think it's just more about, at this point, conveying what I think and less about trying to convey what they might want to hear. Um, it's sort of, it is what it is, and I am who I am. And sometimes it resonates and sometimes it doesn't. But I'm always looking for those students, whether they're adults or juniors, that are open. Open. And and we were open to Tom because there was no option. <laughs> I mean, really, it was his way. But uh, the, the trick is whether people are open and say, okay, let me try that. How long did you, did you work with Tom? Well, uh, this is either a good or a bad story. I... Uh, I wound up living in New Orleans at a time when I would have still worked with Tom. I was working with him from probably 72 to 74. And then playing in Florida, I wound up staying in Florida and then wound up in New Orleans. And I think I would have gone back to Tom, but, uh, you know, life changed for me there. And in fact, I remember once when I did come back and saw you, from New Orleans, you said, boy, you're really working the ball. And that was sort of a dig to say, why don't you take the net, man? Because all the all the tennis on clay changed it. I mean, I used to play the net in, in Louisiana, but I wasn't quite as good. And, you know, it is what it is. And I think the other thing is people mature physically and decline physically on different schedules. <laughs> I mean, really, yeah. I think the last time I played a tournament, I might have been 59 or about 60. But my legs aren't what I wish they were. And so well, I, remember, I remember, Matt, you played Pacific Coast Court 4, uh, I think <laughs> it was against, wasn't that against Len Saputo? I pulled a match out against Len Saputo. And Did you, you remember it when he was, he was ahead 5-2 in the third. And then I was able to get by Greg Shepard first and only time. And then I took a lesson from Steve Cornell in the finals. Okay. All right. <laughs> do you have any, do you have any video of you, not so much tournament play, but do you have any video of you um, <laughs> getting your standard forehand or backhand or, or that? I mean, only, the only reason I say that is because <laughs> to the audience that, I mean, you got the Stowe method um, no, I know. As well as anybody. I mean, I think of guys like you. I think of Larry Extell. Um, I think of, you know, some other guys who really, I think, understood the conk. The conk. And, and, and really could demonstrate it where I never got it. I mean, I, I was because my personality was I want to get in, want to get in. So I was about conking the ball. You're right. Yeah. yeah. So do you have any video of yourself um, doing that? I perhaps. Perhaps. I have a bookshelf with a bunch of old videos on VHS. And I tried to change one of them into a uh, online course uh, with Pat Cash and footwork. But no, at the moment, there may be something, but I'm not sure where it would be. I could look. It just depends how I feel day to day. You know, I, I miss playing. I miss the tournaments. I miss a lot of stuff, but you know, I, well, I just wish you were I'll playing as I said before, because people would be treated um, to the Stowe method. They well, don't, people, they don't really people. see it in me. Yeah. They, I mean, all they see in me is more the mindset, but yeah. with you, they see the technique and all that stuff. And so. I still know your posture could be better. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Enjoy the day. Guys, People listen. To, um, Thank you. Uh, well, Mac, always great to have you on. Um, guys, we'd love to get your feedback. Uh, if you're with us at all, that'd be yeah. great. But we'd love to get your feedback. I I'd like to get it either one or two ways down below in the comments area, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, or you can shoot me an email, uh, brent at webtennis.com. 
Mac, if they've got any questions, can they uh, can they can they send yeah. you an email? Yes, or they can put it there, and I'll respond to them on your site. I don't mind. This was fun. Okay, okay. And, and is the best email Jim at essentialtennisinstruction.com? That's that's good enough. That's a good okay. start. Yeah, right, good. we've got good. sort of platform problems, but yeah, that's good. I I could give you another one, but uh, by the way, I looked at your website yesterday. Spectacular! <laughs> no, it looks great. I mean, I'm just going talk about underperforming. I mean, I look at mine and go, Phew. I got to I got to smoke up a little bit. What a good day! What? Yeah. So I'm trying to create a new path as an interviewer, <laughs> and I actually want to interview more people. Good. I really do. Good. I, I want to do Michael Jessup, and I'm trying to do Jeff Peroviak. Love it. Okay. Well, thank you for this opportunity to interview you. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Um, all right, guys, that's it for us today. Thanks for hanging out. As always, it's time. We got to get out there. Yeah. Help another human have a spectacular day. Mac, I want to do this again real soon. Okay, I promise. All right. See you guys. Bye.